What is a quantum computer and why will it probably never replace our regular computers? The media portrays quantum computers as things of the future, these magical devices that will solve all of our problems and usher in a new age of human development. But what exactly are they and why is it taking so long to build one? I'm Ashley Christine and here's how it works. Classical computers and just about every other piece of technology that you migrate to in your house can be thought of as millions of light switches being turned on and off in trillions of different combinations. When they're presented with a problem to solve, there's a series of trial and error attempts made until a solution is found. It's methodical, but it can be slow. Quantum computers, on the other hand, aren't just on and off switches. They're everything in between, like dimming lights in your rich friend's house. This allows for a quantum computer to test all options simultaneously making them incredibly fast and powerful. This is their greatest appeal. But quantum computers are extremely difficult to make. Between the costs, finicky components, and the insane physics behind the principles, we don't right now have a quantum computer that can perform any useful computations. Classical computers are quickly approaching their physical limit. So the race is on between Google and IPM and a bunch of startups to be the first to conquer these problems and mass produce what might be the most important machine of the 21st century. In your computer, data is represented as bits. These bits are in a binary form, so only two options, one and zero. Remember that because we're gonna come back to this image. There's a lot that goes into making our computers faster and faster. But the part we care about here is transistors and how many of them we can cram together. Transistors are switches that amplify or turn electrical signals on or off. They are the most basic of building blocks of technology and are in everything from household appliances to your cell phone. Transistors are densely packed onto chips and can get pretty small, but herein lies the bottleneck. In 1965, Gordon Moore, a co-founder of Intel, predicted that the number of transistors on those circuits would double every two years. We call it Moore's Law. It's not really a law, more of an observation, and later a capitalistic objective for tech companies to make more money. And so far, it's been holding up pretty well. Basically, the smaller we make transistors and the more of them we can cram together, the faster a computer can run. But at some point, they're so small they're on the atomic scale. And then you're dealing with other issues like managing the heat and controlling the communication between atoms. So there is a physical limit to how fast we can make a computer. We can only go so small. Since our cramming abilities are limited, we rely on thousands of processors to tackle our biggest problems. These are supercomputers and they have a million times the processing power of your laptop. There are a few hundred of them in the world and they do everything from finding new cancer meds to simulating rocket launches to predicting hurricanes, but they're limited by the space they take up and the heat they generate. All of which makes the seemingly unlimited power of a quantum computer so appealing. It's not limited by space or transistors because it's something else entirely. But here's where building one becomes a different challenge. It follows different laws of physics. One way to better understand the differences is that classical computers rely on classical physics. Newton, laws of motion, heat, the things we see every day in our big world that just make sense. While quantum computers rely on the weirder laws of quantum physics that happen on the smallest scale, like entanglement and superposition and general quantum mania. <laughs> entanglement is a word that you've probably heard in passing, as one does. And the idea at its root is pretty simple. It's two connected particles. When we entangle particles, which can be done manually in a few different ways, what happens to one instantly affects the other, even if they're light years apart. When we say particles, by the way, we mean fundamental particles. You thought it stopped at atoms and neutrons, but it gets worse. These are the building blocks of our existence and they are inside you right now. This is as small as it gets, as far as we know. Don't. <laughs> Quantum computers can use different particles, but most companies stick with electrons and photons. Superposition is a quantum state represented as the sum of two or more states. It sounds like a math problem, because it is. Basically, it's being in multiple states at the same time. In regard to quantum computers, it's a blend between one and zero until measured. The until measured part is where a lot of people get confused. Why would something change its behavior, become a one, for example, just because we looked at it? The easiest way to explain 
explain this is with the double slit experiment. In 1801, Thomas Young performed experiments to determine whether light behaved as a wave or a particle. If you shoot particles of sand through two slits in a sheet of metal, you'll get this pattern with lines clearly showing where the sand piled up. But if you push water through, then what's called an interference pattern appears on the back wall instead. So what happens when you do this with light? You can perform this experiment at home and you'll see the interference pattern of a wave model. And that appeared to be the end of that. Light was a wave. But a hundred years later, Einstein was like, mm, no, light is made of particles called photons. So once we developed the technology to send individual photons through the slits, we shot one through and it landed straight on the other side like a particle. But if we keep shooting them over and over, they eventually form an interference pattern again, like a wave. But hooray, it gets worse. They set up a detector and decided to watch what each particle was doing so they could figure out how it was splitting itself or whatever was happening for particles to create a wave pattern. Suddenly, under observation, it returned to a particle again. They realized that it can behave as a particle and a wave. The act of observing made a difference. It's as if particles care whether or not we're watching them. And it doesn't matter if it's us or a dog or a camera, it knows. When the universe asks, what are you doing? It makes a decision. When this happens, we describe it by saying that the wave function collapses. That once an observation is made, the wave collapses and chooses a state. I know that's a weird way of describing it. Like why were those words chosen? And it's because they were built off of mathematical observations where those words have different meanings. Basically, these things weren't named for the general public. Why wave function collapse matters is because it shows how sensitive these systems are and why building a computer off of these laws is so challenging. How we use superposition in quantum computers is qubits. A qubit is the equivalent of bits in a regular computer, but with the Q in front, so you know it's fancy. A qubit can exist in multiple states at the same time, a kind of blend between one and zero. And entanglement allows multiple qubits to be manipulated in a single operation. Once it's observed, it collapses into a state. In this case, either one or zero. All of this is what allows quantum computers to explore multiple solutions at the same time. It's like everything happening everywhere all at once. For a classical computer to match just 500 of these entangled qubits, it would need more regular bits than there are atoms in the universe. So there is no comparison in potential here. But the quantum states in these machines are extremely delicate. They don't like loud noises, vibrations, temperature shifts, or any disruptions at all. I can relate. All of which causes them to be kind of prone to error. And what would be the point of using a quantum computer if you always need to check the answer with a classical computer. One critical piece of equipment to offset these sensitivities is superconductors. They are materials with no electrical resistance, meaning they're low energy and the wires don't get hot. So they do an excellent job supporting a stable environment. But superconductors are a pain all on their own. They require extreme conditions like temperatures just above absolute freezing and your parents won't wanna pay for that electric bill. So this needs its own separate progress. The thing is, there's really no rush. Quantum Quantum computers probably won't replace classical computers because their function is completely different. Quantum computers can handle massive amounts of data that would overwhelm your laptop. So they'll be handy for cryptography, finance, weather forecasting, and especially AI, which is its own video. But for your calendar or scrolling through TikTok, it's too much. Your phone functions just fine and will probably never need the ultimate power of a quantum computer. So although there are many applications and its solutions and modeling capabilities could finally push us to being a type one civilization on the Carter ship scale. Quantum computers have many challenges until every major lab in the world has one, not every living room.